is 8.34. How worried are the Americans about your burgeoning relations with China? Because a lot of people think this is, this is at the heart of their change of policy. Well, I, to tell you the truth, I don't know. Uh, is that why they're changing their policies? I don't know. Uh, is uh, the change in their policy because they just want uh, our relationship to recover? I don't know. But given the geopolitical politics, which governs everything in international affairs, it's fair to say, isn't it, that the Americans would be concerned that China has got a much more, a much stronger foothold in Fiji? Well, China has been here since 1975. It's just that uh, our relationship has, has strengthened over the last uh, few years. Eye on the World makes a return to the show uh, with Paul Buchanan, uh, co-founder and principal at 36 Parallel Assessments, joining us this morning. Good morning to you, Paul. Good morning. Good morning. Um, today we're covering the um, uh, the the MFAT emails uh, that were hacked, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and um, what uh, those emails tell us about some of the inside ball, the inside game that is being played in the power play in the Pacific, Paul. Uh, yeah, they're actually very interesting. Admittedly, uh, you know, they are private emails, and it's unfortunate that they were hacked. There's the whole sidebar about uh, the minister using private email addresses to circumvent the OIA, uh, but we'll leave that aside. The two interesting things about the correspondence between John Hayes and Murray McCulley was that Hayes advised McCulley to resist China in the Pacific and then went on to complain about inefficiencies and waste in aid programs to Pacific Island countries uh, advised him on uh, where he might want to engage the budgetary cutbacks within MFAT. In a word, Hayes was telling McCulley more or less what McCulley should have known anyway in very undiplomatic language. And what's interesting about that is, first of all, the Chinese will certainly take notice of the fact that New Zealand, which is a, a uh, China is the second largest trading partner of New Zealand, we have that bilateral FTA with them. Uh, you know, I may find that the New Zealand's attitude uh, is less than complimentary. And uh, we may see some sort of pushback on the part of the Chinese. Uh, that may be down the road. And then the second aspect of this is that uh, because it was Hayes giving advice to McCulley and not the other way around, uh, and McCulley did not front up to announce the budget and staff cuts uh, the CEO of MFAT did that, John Allen, it suggests perhaps that McCulley is either disengaged or a little bit out of his depth huh. when it comes to issues of foreign affairs. In a word, uh, neither one of those two things is a good look. And uh, as you say, at the same time, there are these, uh, these cuts going on. Uh, meanwhile, but there are also um, upgrades going on to the embassy in Beijing. Well, certainly the... Uh, you know, New Zealand sees China as its preeminent trading partner down the road. Right now, it's second only to Australia. Uh, it's already surpassed the United States. And uh, let's be frank, there's sort of a schizophrenic, if you will, foreign policy at play today in New Zealand. On the one hand, New Zealand is looking to Asia and the Middle East for trade opportunities, even as it negotiates the Trans-Pacific Partnership with the United States and eight other, eight other countries. But it's tied itself, as of the Wellington Declaration of 2010, uh, more firmly with the United States and Australia in terms of security. And that balancing act may work today, but should uh, tensions between the United States and China increase as China begins to flex its muscles as an emerging great power, then that position may become untenable. So we shall see down the road. It just strikes me that there is a sort of schizophrenia or incoherence to the current foreign policy uh, approach, and that may have something to do with McCulloch. Yeah, um, and a definite disconnection between what is being said um, publicly uh, here in New Zealand and what is going on behind the scenes. You know, should, the, uh, should the public at all be concerned about that? Well, I think that uh, we, I think the public may not realize the importance of diplomatic representation uh, for a small island country such as this. Uh, you know, for years, New Zealand's punched above its weight. It's a cliche 
But if you think in terms of multinational peacekeeping, disarmament, climate controls, all those sort of things, New Zealand is, is very much present in all of the discussions, and more importantly, it's listened to. If we engage in a lot of cutbacks, uh, particularly of frontline diplomatic staff, it's not just about you know, New Zealanders traveling, having no one to come and rescue them if they get in trouble. It's the larger picture, New Zealand's role in the world as a small democracy, a democracy committed to a non-nuclear policy, a democracy supposedly committed to human rights uh, throughout the world. And in the measure that we cut back, frontline diplomatic staff, and let's, let's be very clear, diplomats have real skills other than going to cocktail parties. Mm -hmm. They need to know languages, to have diplomatic tact. I mean, these people are very skilled labor. And so in the measure that you cut back on the numbers of people doing diplomatic tasks, you're going to be underrepresented and you're going to diminish your footprint in global affairs. Um, just got a, um, a, a short wee clip here um, about those um, cuts. Let's take a look at this. Sure. The fat is being cut from MFAT. The ministry's chief executive saying it's become top heavy and its process is cumbersome. The situation that we are proposing is to create a smaller ministry. 600 staff will be forced to reapply for their jobs, 305 roles will be slashed in the process, 169 are New Zealanders working here and overseas, 136 are overseas roles held by locals in the area. The cuts... Hey Paul, that, uh, do you see that, um, that perhaps these cuts are uh, not so much a, a downgrade of the ministry overall, but a, um, a, a redeployment of those staff into areas of more concern, perhaps? Uh, well, they haven't said so. And uh, from all appearances, they're going to close two embassies. They're going to enclose a number of consular uh, positions. And so uh, right there, there is a diminishing, I'm afraid to say. And you can see the reorientation because the embassies are going to be closed in Europe. And uh, diplomatic representation, as we've just talked about, is going to increase in Beijing and more than likely the Middle East, given uh, trade flows between the countries. Uh, but I think the most important thing to consider is that 600 staff, including diplomats, are going to uh, have to reapply for their jobs on a yearly basis. That sort of job insecurity is going to drive people away from public service and from the diplomatic service. The one thing you want to know in any job, but certainly in a diplomatic uh, position, is that someone has your back, that uh, you can go and get in country for two to three years on a diplomatic assignment and not worry uh, uh, whether or not your job uh, will be disestablished year to year or that you will be forced to come back early in order to apply with a new pool of candidates. And of course, if you're thinking about money cutting, the more senior the diplomat, the greater the salary. The greater the salary, the more likely it will be cut unless the position is absolutely deemed essential. All, all in all, I think that even though you can probably do uh, some good cutting, uh, particularly in human resources, uh, you can get rid of a lot of those people without any discernible harm to the operation of the ministry, if you start cutting back on diplomats, you're going to find yourself in trouble. Mm. So um, with, with, the, uh, with the power play in the Pacific between America and China, um, uh, and, and, and the situation also with Fiji as well, um, an, an unstable regime there, you know, where does this put New Zealand? What, you know, what is our position now um, as, a, as, a, as a small power down in the South Pacific? Well, that's, that's the very interesting conundrum we now face ourselves. We're doing all these cutbacks at the same time that China is establishing a very significant presence in the South Pacific. Uh, New Zealand doesn't have diplomatic representation in a crucial island state such as Fiji because of the antagonism between the Baimi Marama regime and Australia and New Zealand as a result of the 2006 coup. The Chinese don't care about the nature of the regime. They about returns, they're using what's known as checkbook diplomacy, which essentially is to fund developmental projects uh, without any strings attached. Because there are no strings attached, there's no transparency clauses or good governance protocols, the Chinese basically give money where it suits them best. There's some suspicion that that money may go into the pockets of politicians rather than to the people themselves. But whatever the case, the Chinese are definitely here to stay. 
Uh, their diplomatic and economic endeavors have won them a lot of friends in the Pacific, and it's only a matter of time before they start projecting military force into the South Pacific, not because they're a terrible imperialist country, but because as an emerging great power, they have to secure the sea lines of communication between Australasia, Latin America, and the Chinese mainland. They depend on Latin America and Australia in particular for raw material imports, minerals specifically. And those, uh, all those raw material imports flow through the South Pacific. China has no military allies in the South Pacific, and so they will have to do it themselves. It was just announced yesterday that they've increased their defense budget by 11.3%. That amounts to $95.6 billion American. Uh, some people think the figure is low. And most of that is oriented to uh, building their Navy so that it has an expeditionary blue water capacity. Even though they may be interested in protecting the South China Sea, they're looking much further afield. And you can see that in the construction of ballistic nuclear submarines as well as their first aircraft carriers. So China is doing what it has to do to be a great power in a very fluid world environment. And the United States, along with its allies, New Zealand and Australia, obviously have concerns about that, hence the phrase resist China. Huh. And I would argue that we may well see a military buildup in the region and, China, and New Zealand is not particularly well positioned to exercise any sort of influence, particularly on Fiji, but perhaps on other island states in the measure that the Chinese influence grows. Hmm. We really are just a, um, a, a small player in this, um, this very large pond. Uh, Paul Buchanan, we really appreciate your time on this and look forward to Eye on the World next week as well. Thanks very much. My pleasure. That is uh, Paul Buchanan, who's co-founder and principal at 36 Parallel Assessments. It is now 8.42.